Sorry, I'm a little bit late. I'm just a couple of minutes late because of the... Uh, I'm just a minute late because I had a technical issue. So I was just trying to sort that out. And uh, welcome. So let me just get my settings all up here again and we'll get rolling. There we go. Okay, so today, here's what we're going to do. We're going to be painting this lovely, um, this beautiful horse, actually, gorgeous horse. And uh, we're. Uh, this was something that was requested a few times, so I thought I would uh, work on this one today. I'm not going to do the full body because, um, well, mostly because of time, but, uh, but I also really like this photograph. Now, let me tell you about the photograph. It is from Unsplash, uh, and there is a link underneath the video so that you can uh, reference that. All right, so this is our reference. You can see that this has printed out a lot more blue than the digital image here. And uh, that is one of the things that can happen sometimes when you print just on regular copy paper or from your inkjet printer. Um, so, when uh, the reason I picked this particular picture is because of this gorgeous light. And, and this is unusual lighting. Not unusual tremendously, but this is more of a midday lighting where you get cool highlights and warm shadows. So... If it's later in the day, you get warm highlights and cool shadows, uh, but in this case, we have uh, cool highlights. So they, they, that, that's why the printer has picked up so much of that blue color. All right, so I have this drawn out. I am using Arches 140 pound uh, cold press paper. I'll be using an assortment of uh, Da Vinci watercolors. And I just realized I don't have my, my palette cam here. Just once, can you bear with me for one moment as I set that up? Okay, <laughs> hopefully we have this here. Uh, now let me reduce the picture of the horse for a moment so that we can see the palette a little bit better. There we go. So we are using um, mostly Da Vinci watercolors, but it doesn't matter if you're using any other uh, very popular artist quality brand it's uh, you know Winsor Newton, Daniel Smith, Holbein and and a whole slew of others are professional quality just you'll find that you'll get the richer colors if you don't if if the paint doesn't say academy or uh, something along those lines academic uh, you know anything that suggests student just simply means that it's it's got more fillers to make it affordable so there we go. We have our, um, I have it drawn out here on my uh, arches block. And to start this, in order, because horses are so muscular, they, uh, you know, they have a lot of uh, definition in their, in their form. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start off with the, uh, with the muscles and the, you know, some of these darker shadows. So muscles have shadows, you know, obviously they have form, so they have a shadow. So I'm going to start by putting in some of the shadows before even doing some of my first washes. So for that, I'm going to use, uh, I'll use some burnt sienna and maybe a bit of Payne's Gray. Burnt sienna Payne's Gray is going to give me a nice dark brown. Got to get my paints a little wetter, so I'm just going to add a little bit 
just some of my colors. Any of the colors I might use, I'm just going to wet those. That should do it. All right, so Burnt Sienna and Payne's Gray. I'm making a fairly dark brown. But this dark brown, I'm not going to put it on heavy. I'm just, uh, I'm going to do like a ghost version of the forms before I actually work on the, uh, you know, all the subtle values and things like that. There's a couple of things that are extra bright. You would have the option of uh, masking those off. I'm going to try and paint around them, but I'm going to use this dark brown. And I'm going to carefully block in where all those shadows are. All right, so behind the ear, it's obviously dark here. That's not exactly a muscle, but it is a dark area. And what I like to do in a lot of my painting is to kind of get some of these things established right at the start uh, so that I can visualize and see what the form is actually going to be. I'm also going to be paying attention to whether the edges are soft or hard. So in some cases, if I want to have soft edges, maybe on both sides, I might take a flat brush like this and dampen it, blot it on my paper towel, dampen it and just brush the area just before I put the paint on. That's going to give me soft edges so that I don't have to fuss and go around and, and soften the edges as I'm going. However, sometimes you need one hard edge and one soft edge and that's when you don't wet it first. If you want it soft all around, yes, go ahead. Always pay attention to the to the edges. Sometimes the muscles are a little bit like a rolling hill, right? They they go up and they go down. There's no crisp lines, uh, unless you know it's a really pronounced muscle and. Uh, certain light is hitting it in a, you know, you're looking at an angle and it's the light's hitting it a certain way. You might have a hard edge, but in most cases, those are going to be soft edges. It is raining here too. It is, but we had a lovely day yesterday, so I can't complain. All right, there's a couple of little folds right here. I'm going to put those in. And there's a shadow behind some of the hairs that are coming down. But I see a, a triangular shape here. It's almost a, almost a triangle. Uh, comes up towards this shape right here. Now I'm not going to uh, slow this down and, and take a long time with this today because, you know, we only have an hour, but I'm going to do the best I can. Now some of these shapes around the eye here, for example, they're going to be kind of soft. So I'm blotting my brush. I want you to see that I'm blotting my brush. It's not really wet, wet. but it's just enough that I can paint into a slightly damp surface. And that's going to help me control, you know, how, how far all of this color blends. Don't wet too large an area and bite off more than you can chew. But there's a, a strong shape right here behind the eye. And I'm looking for those darker, stronger shapes. I'll go around the eye for now, but I will certainly come back and detail the eye later. Leave those details for later on. And not at the edge, 
not at the edge, but down this this part of the uh, what do they call that? The muzzle? I don't know what they call that on a horse, but the face, just down the face here. I know there's probably one or two horse people out there. It it is not a synthetic brush, but it could be. It, it you know certainly wouldn't hurt to have this as a as a uh, synthetic brush that would work just as well for this type of uh, thing that I'm doing right now. This is a squirrel hair brush that I'm using. I'm rather fond of these squirrel hair brushes, but uh, you know it's not a must-have kind of thing. And. Now this would apply, like imagine you're doing, uh, and if you want watercolor, somebody's probably going to ask you at one time or another, can you paint my dog or cat? And uh, you would approach the, the forms of the body in the same way where you would uh, paint the shadows. But before you paint in the shadows, ask yourself, are those warm shadows or are those cool shadows? What time of day was this photograph taken? because the time of day will determine whether or not you want to go more cool in the blues or purples and and whether or not you want to go warmer uh, in the middle of the day. The way this printed out, it really showed that the highlights were in cool colors. So I'm dampening this spot here, just where I'm going to work. Don't want to wet the halter because I don't want the colors bleeding into the halter. I am painting around it, but you could you could mask that in advance if you wanted to. Very true. April flat April showers do bring May flowers. Actually, everything's flowering here right now. Uh, it's like everything exploded, and we're uh, we're being inundated with butterflies. I almost did a butterfly demo today, but. Yeah, do let me know if, you know, if there's a particular uh, thing that you would like to, like me to share, by all means, go ahead and uh, add that in the chat. This brush, I find, is so helpful. Now, this one is a synthetic brush, okay? This one doesn't hold a ton of uh, water or paint, but this one will. So I have to be careful that I don't overload this one. Maybe I'll just switch to my synthetic so that you can see what that would work out as. Okay, I've got a synthetic. This is a synthetic round, same size. Well, actually, it's a six. Yeah, that was a six I was using. So I've got two synthetic brushes now, a flat and a round. My flat is damp, and I can dampen an area just prior to painting into it. And that's always going to ensure that I, I get softness and I don't have hard lines in all of these places. All right, so we can already start to see the, the mu uh, muscular uh, form of this face. Yes, the, the list of ma yeah, the list of materials are uh, that I almost always use are on my website. It's there. There's also a link underneath this video, so you can find that. But I have a page called Materials, and on that page is a list of um, potent like places where you can buy purchase things. If you know of somebody who sells products, like art products, because uh, it's getting, it's always been harder since COVID to find exactly what you want at a good price. So if you know of a supplier that I don't have listed, um, send me a note about that and let me know and I'll try and add that on. Okay, so I've dampened this area between the halter with my synthetic brush, I want to get this really strong uh, shadow right here. My brush was too wet, that's why it's spreading more than I want it to. 
but I can get that under control. But I, I really want to have just a, a really good, strong uh, basis on which I can build. To, you know, sometimes you take a, a wash and you put it over and then you add your darks in. But when I'm trying to do subtle forms like this, when, when you've got muscles and, and whatnot, I do find it very helpful to kind of put the shadows in uh, first, especially if it's all one tone. Um, if you have, uh, well, even if you have like a calico cat, you would still, uh, you know, maybe in a soft gray or something, you could, you could establish the, uh, the forms. I, I am, I am painting the darkest, uh, shades first. So, um, yes. So that, that is exactly what I'm doing. I am wetting each area first. Now, there's a dark area around the mouth here, but because there's a lot of sort of light hitting it in this one spot, I mean, it, the horse's mouth is actually dark. It's not dark because of a shadow. So it's important to note that difference because if, if, the, if the horse hair or the skin of the horse is dark, um, the shadows actually might be kind of, um, kind of light. Uh, um, they may not necessarily be warm, is what I'm saying. But I'm looking mostly for the muscle structure at this point. And this would be the same if you painted the entire horse. Uh, you know, legs and, and all of that. If they, you know, if you had a, a nice reference of the horse and running or something like that. But what I'm picking up in my brush is very little color, not really wet color, and my brush isn't really wet. And that gives me, because I'm working on a wet paint surface, I want to make sure I've got some control when I put the paint down. I'm just going to put that mouth in there right now where that opening is. And I'm looking for these, these sort of muscular structures. All right, those muscular structures, I'm, I want to put that in on wet so that they soften. If they don't soften enough, you can take this same damp brush and brush it over and you can see how much lighter that got and more blended that became. And once you start to see some of the subtle structures, you're going to see every muscle on the horse. You're, you're going to notice them. It's because you're looking for them, right? And that's what I want you to do is for actually look for those structures and not just be thinking oh you know it's a brown horse paint it brown it's it's got a change in color and value so i want to make note of all of those things All right, so you can really start to see the, the, each of the muscles. It does help me when you put your questions in capitals because then I can, I can see it when I glance up. Yeah, I remember I had, um, I have, I have a very good friend who, uh, who loves horses. She's, I mean, she's got horses and she's riding all the time. And she once asked me in grade six, I think she asked me to paint 
to help do her book cover or something that she her report that she was doing <laughs> and I did the best I could for however old I was at the time I guess I would have been like 10 or 11 and uh, she quickly pointed out how 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 many mistakes I'd made <laughs> but, um, but you know I was I was I just painted what I thought a horse looked like instead of actually looking to see how a horse looked and of course I learned that later in life that you you don't paint what you think is there you paint what you actually see even if it even if your brain says it doesn't make sense you you paint what you actually see because the it's been captured in the f photograph so you know that those shadows are actually there All right, I'm dampening this neck area here. Well, I don't want a hard line where the mane is, so I will just uh, blend up into there as well. But I'm looking for the the stronger, darker, the stronger dominant shadows here, or um, muscles. We have the jaw line that comes kind of straight down right there. Should blot that brush a little more. This is coming down into the into the jaw, like this ends up connecting into the jaw. Some of these shapes are actually uh, just shading, but uh, some of them, like many of them, are, are actually muscles. Uh, forces are, are quite fascinating, really. They, they're they so powerful and yet so gentle. You know, they can be very uh, intelligent and, and loving animals. going to bring some of these shadows up in here and once you have a lot of the, that muscle structure built you know then you can start coming in with washes and building it and these will show through what you've done if this weren't a demo would I paint the background first oh probably yeah I probably would uh but I can do it afterwards as well uh, you know I just have to be a little more careful around uh, but it does make it really challenging to do, like to paint around little hairs like this, if you were to do the background first, uh, last. If you do it first, you can put the darker hairs on top. If there were, like for example, right along the edge of the ear, and you've got these lighter hairs, I might even take um, my masking fluid and uh, this, where's that little tool of mine? This little here I might even use that and put a few little light hairs so that I could easily put that wet wet background in there I could also um, you know do this part and then do my background and then finish the horse you know I don't have to do just one or the other like keep them separate I could actually kind of do them um, simultaneously but yeah typically I would uh, do that. So down here in the the belly area, I'm going to dampen this. I made that a little bit wet so I might have to wait for a moment but I'll do the big shadow first because then it won't matter so much but if my brush is drier it won't spread so far so I'm going to come in here and get some of this and I see that some of this 
some of this uh, shadow actually gets some really nice uh, reddish color in it as well, that kind of chestnut color. So I don't want to just do all of this in there. I, I just need to know where that where that basic shape is there. And my brush strokes are following the the form of the of that hind leg. So it comes in from this sort of an angle. It, it bends in that direction. So if any of my brush marks show, I'd like them to be in the right direction. All right, so now I have some, some of the muscle structures up in here, but these ones are in the light. So these shadows aren't as brown as, uh, they're not as brown as, you know, some of these areas down here. That one's blending out where I don't want it. So I'm just picking it up with my damp brush, clean damp brush. Pick it up, so keep it under control. And I'm going to use a little blue in this. Uh, I just picked a blue that I had there. I, I believe it was had some cobalt in it. So that these shadows aren't going to be quite as brown. So less of the burnt sienna. Those lines are getting a little bit dry. I can see that they're dry. They're making hard edges. So I'm going to brush over that spot again before any of that sets. And I can come in to lightly add in some of those shadows. So you can already start to see the form of the horse. Um, it's already shaping up pretty nicely. And, th and then I can just build on this. Keep this brush clean though that's going to be important keep washing it off because as you brush especially if you've brushed over um, something you've done you've picking picking up color so This is pretty dark on this side. Make sure that all gets blended in. Having two brushes like this is really helpful because it gives you, like, you can work fast. You can react fast. Maybe that's the better term is you can react fast. Yeah, very much so. Uh, these these steps are very much like a grisai and and we will build on that oh this paper is it's a block and it is i believe uh, 9 by 12 i don't have the cover for it anymore but it's 9 by 12 i believe yes 9 by 12 and But I think this sort of grisaille type of, of application is a, um, is a good foundation for your painting when you're talking about muscles, especially since you can wet the paper first. If I've already got 
a wash on there and I start wetting it, I'm going to start moving around that first wash. So in that sense, it's probably good if I were to uh, get these muscles in first. Then when I wet and put the wet wash on, these will still sh shine through and it really won't move too much because it's not as it's not quite as wet as it as like an initial first wash would normally be. Um, okay, so I want to make sure I'm not uh, moving anything here, so I'm just going to dry what I have. And it really wasn't too difficult to work around the, the halter. But I do need a lot more darkness on this side. Let that cool a little bit. And I can fine tune some of those muscles. I've, I mean, if you see smaller muscles, this is a great time to add that in. You can dampen a spot. I mean, when I say muscles, um, I'm talking about the shadows of muscles, but you can include your other shadows sort of simultaneously because it all works together as an in, in the composition. Not soft enough. because it dried too fast with that dryer. I didn't let it let the paper cool down enough, I suppose. But I want you to notice when I'm doing these uh, muscles on the horse, I'm working on damp paper with a fairly dry brush. Uh, if this brush is as wet or wetter than the paper, all bets are off and, and you ha don't have the control you're looking for. So make sure your paint that you're picking up, let me bring this over so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. You see that paint, that's not a puddle. That is fairly, fairly dried paint. My palette's kind of a mess, but, uh, <laughs> but that's fairly dry paint. It's not, uh, it's not a big puddle of, and I haven't loaded up the brush. Obviously, paper wasn't wet enough there, so I blot this brush. And I can run that along and get that nice and soft the way I need it. Just, But you have to react qu quickly, which is why it's good to have two brushes. You know, I've got that right ready. This is a really prominent uh, muscle here. I'm going to go back to some of those more blue blue gray uh, type shadows or shadows yes uh, in in this area around the mouth and nose dampening first though so it's everything's still got that softness it will look very angular if you if you have hard edges it will start to look very angular It is similar to the grisaille technique. You 
You are so welcome. I'm happy to do this. Okay, so I'm coming around this mouth area where it's kind of a blacker um, skin around the m mouth and nose. I'm getting that in there and that's just going warm or cool is going to remind me whether or not it is got to be a highlight or it's going to be a shadow. Uh, this is obviously going to get darker. This is just sort of my ghost version of where I'm heading with this. Dampening all this left side here. Now there's a there's a real shine on this, the coat uh, of on the neck. You can see a shine, a sh you know, and it's it's very warm in this shape here, and it's very cool in, in the highlight areas of those. Very often, it's darks that will reflect blue, especially if they're outdoors, because it's reflecting the sky. So where the highlights are on dark animals. So if you're doing, say, a black lab or something like that, uh, you often will see the highlights are quite blue. And that's a result of being outdoors and catching all the, the sky color. But I really picked this particular reference. There were a lot of really nice, beautiful, beautiful horse photos. But I was looking for uh, light in particular. And I often do, will do that with um, all my watercolors, really. Because for me, it's all about the light. But... Um, but I really enjoy seeing the the differences between the shadows and the highlights. You don't you don't get that on an overcast day so much, you know, because there's just not as much light showing, or there's not as much um, shadow showing, and therefore you can't show the light without the shadow. At the moment, that kind of looks like a, an Appaloosa or something like that, where you've got uh, spots on the horse. But it, by the time you put the finished uh, wash on there, that will look fine. Some of these shadows will be darker than others. And some of them will transition. So like on this neck here, I'm going to start overlapping some of this. So we see the obvious fading into the light uh, start to happen. This brush is helping me keep things fluid and, and moving, flowing. And don't worry about this first stage, you know, having all your washes, you know, perfect and smooth and all of that. Don't worry so much about that. When you put another layer on all of this, uh, it will sort of help blend that much more easily. Oh, it's, notice my brush marks are always following the the direction of the the muscle or the direction of the fur or whatever the case may be. I'm always following the contours so that they will um, the structure will be there. A 
All right, so there's a nice transition between warm and cool here. And it's it's all because I did it on, on uh, damp paper. But I have to be very careful not to blend those together. If I start brushing willy-nilly in every direction, uh, that's where the trouble begins. If I come in with a wet brush here right now, that's trouble too, because that's going to make a blossom. So let's avoid those mistakes and just dry what we have. This will kind of set the color and then it won't move around on us. Whenever I get something I like, it's a good time to dry because then it holds that color where it is. Good to know. Lighter round spots are called dapples and reflect a healthy horse. See, I learned something new. Oh, okay. How long did it take me to master tonal values and also what colors to use? Well, let me tell you, um, you know, people often ask, how long have I been painting? And uh, the, I guess the honest answer is probably 50 years. <laughs> but if, but for the first 40 of those 50 years that I was painting, I, I was painting sporadically. I wasn't painting all the time. I wasn't focused on painting. I wasn't painting well. So I spent 40 years just sort of in and out of watercolor. Uh, I actually painted in other mediums and that sort of thing. Uh, it's sometimes very hard to quantify ex exactly, exactly when it started. But I would have to say that uh, I, my concentration on watercolor really really knuckled down, uh, well, it knuckled down when I was starting to teach, but then when COVID hit and I was doing a lot more and I was being a lot more thoughtful about it and my process and everything else, uh, and I just, the more I painted, the more I saw. And I don't think that there's a substitute for that. I mean, you just need to learn to look, look for every muscle. Uh, and as you're looking for those muscles, you're or, or the highlights and shadows and the values, because the values are the most important part, the, um, the more you look for those, the more, uh, more you notice other things. Oh, that's more of a blue, or that's a little bit more brown. Like, I can't say it was, um, you know, April 14th, uh, 2015, or anything like that. I can't, can't give you a specific date. I, all I can do is tell you that it was a progression and that the more, uh, this is what I would advise. If you want to paint better, paint more often, frequently, and focus on it. Don't, don't just sort of say, well, I'll do watercolor this week, but then oh, I might do some acrylic next week and that sort of thing. Really focus on it, uh, concentrate, and, and you'll see, you'll see much faster growth. So we have um, some pretty good structure, I think, at this point, and we can start thinking about washes. One thing I would like to do though, just so we don't lose any of the pencil lines and things like that, is I wanna get some of these darks in like the eye and the nose. So I might as well zoom in on the eye. This is obviously a very um, dark chestnut kind of eye. So I find that when I'm doing details like this, I, I'm not going to do it too detailed right now, but it helps to really have the reference very close to where you're working. I find that I can do a much better job. Now I notice that there's some highlights in there. I'm going to leave them white for now. But I'm looking for where those extra darks are. So this is a, a lot of Payne's Gray. I want to use more brown in the bottom here. So 
So that would be burnt sienna. So I'm going to use some burnt sienna here. And then we have, we have all those bits of blue in there. So let's put some blue in the top part. I'm going to use cobalt blue. But I want to make sure that this cobalt blue I'm using is not dark. I, I need it very light because it is, of course, a reflection and of light. And so I have it diluted blue, which I will put in here. Now that's not the shape, that's just the general area. Because I know the darks can go over top. While I have this blue out, I'm going to find some of the blue around the eye as well. There's this sort of outline of black horse hair or skin, I guess it is, around the eye. But I better soften that. Don't want a hard line there. All right, looks a little funny right now. But I'm going to move on to the to the nose here. And I'm working on dry here, but I'm going to uh, get the darkness of the interior of the nose. Really look at that shape. It's not like a person's nose, that's for sure. But some of the softening that has to happen is really important because if without the softening of edges, uh, it won't look like the those edges of the nose, the nostril, won't look cylindrical or tubular. They're a little rounded, uh, you know, they're not like a hard edge. So soften, soften, soften. And I've just, I'm just using a very well blotted brush to soften this very uh, small area. Actually, I'm going to dampen this spot. Oh, I have paint on that brush. That's not good. Wipe that off. Okay, so I'm going to dampen in here. Get that a little darker there. I'm softening these edges. They're very important. And there's actually a couple of little wrinkles around the mouth here. Uh, you know, you can probably see them on the camera. Uh, but these little wrinkles that kind of come from this muscle straight down. Uh, I'm going to wait for that to get a little drier because they're so small. If I did it right now, you would they would just sort of all melt together. And sometimes this happens where it, it, it blends out more than you wanted it to or more than you intended it to. So just blot your brush and pick up where you don't want it to blend out towards. And that's fine. So I'm going to take those little... Uh, Those little hairs or those little creases, there's actually almost look like little freckles. See what I mean? The more you do, the closer you get. Sorry, it's trying to focus. 
but the more you do, the um, more you notice, <laughs> right? You, you and you can actually get tunnel vision uh, on some of this detail stuff. And I don't want to get too too bogged down. I just don't want these lines to get lost. So now this is with pre. This is brush. You can see it's dry. It's the bristles wouldn't stay like that if it were wet. But I want to come in. In this little section here, so that strong muscle right there, and then these little lines right up on the tip toe of my brush. I don't have to know everything there is to know about horses to draw them. All I need to know is that if I look at the shadows, I should be able to paint it. The shadows and highlights are very important. Okay, so let's zoom out now. We've got something there. I could um, I could do a little more on the eye here. Let's uh, maybe just get this tear duct painted in. It's it's very dark right here. I want to make sure I get the the shape and the darkness of this. the eyelid. I've got to leave that little sliver because there's a little highlight on that lower lid. It's not very much, but it's there. So I don't need to finish the eye right now. I mean, I could, but I don't want to finish the eye right now. I'm just, I want to, I want to get the eye done relative to what else I've done. Uh, so I want to, um, I want to get some washes on the, on the main part of the horse first. I was using that same Payne's Gray. Uh, I was using Payne's Gray and Burnt Sienna. Not necessarily mixed together at this point because I, um, it's too small an area. It would just all, everything would look the same. All right, so let's, I'm going to move to a softer brush. So this one's, this one is a squirrel hair brush. In fact, I'll use one a little bigger than this one. I'll use like a an 8 or a 10. If I can find it here. This one's this one's a large one. This is a this is a 10 squirrel hair brush and you can see it looks more mop like and so it holds a lot. You know, it's got this big fat belly. Comes to a point when it's wet. Uh, I like these mop brushes a lot. So now we need something sort of reddish. And what I would recommend is uh, that you don't go just burnt sienna. Incorporate some uh, reds in there as well as some, you know, some blues. Now, I don't mean to mix them together. We're going to mix the, do let those colors mingle on the paper. Yeah, I agree, Linda. It does, it does come to life once you see that... Uh, <laughs> that eye but I won't finish it 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 just means that there's there's a soul there now so we will go ahead and do that so let's clear a spot I haven't got very many places to mix color here always oh, jumping from one class to another my palette doesn't get the love it should should have <laughs> the love it deserves it gets messy quite often. I'll just keep that little bit there because I'll probably use that again. I 
but I want to mix some light colors. Now, now I will work light to dark. I'll start with some of my light washes, like my highlights, um, and we'll work from there. So let's let's talk about this hind, uh, the hind part of the horse, around the face, behind the face. I'm going to wet this area. In fact, I don't need that careful a line there, but um, I'll put it there anyway. I'm wetting all the way over to here, even though I'm only going to paint here. Just change that light a little bit. If that's okay. And I'm going to use some cobalt blue. Really diluted so that we get a little bit of soft color in here. There's nothing on the horse that's pure white. It kind of almost looks like it, but not pure white. But you can see how pale I did that. Uh, really pale. All right, so now now we're coming we're transitioning from that highlight into the shadow. So we need something a little brighter in the mid value. So I'm going to use uh, burnt sienna. We'll try some burnt sienna, but I'll I'll end up using something a little bit brighter as well. We'll try some burnt sienna here. Everything's nice and wet, so it's it should blend together really nicely. And there's something that uh, that happens when when colors transition from highlight to shadow. In highlight, the they're kind of faded and, and washed out. Uh, but then, and in shadows, they're duller and they're darker. But what about that? transition area where it goes like not not quite light not quite dark so in the mid values the mid values are where you're going to get your brightest cleanest color uh, the most vibrancy in your color so um, if it's if it's going to have some orange it's going to be in these areas Oh, okay. <laughs> um, hindquarters, that's what these are called. So it, I'm not really adding anything to my burnt sienna here. Uh, the color is going to be just sort of clean right out of the tube, fresh color. And you can see that it's got a lot more life to it. Uh, but it is transitioning and it's blending into these shadows. So I bring it right down into there. And there's a couple of... Um, really orangey spots right here. You know, if you wanted to mix a little orange, I don't have an orange on my palette. I usually mix it. So if I take a little like, gamboge and rose door or something like that, I can make a brighter orange to put into a spot like this, right? So that's given me that brighter color in there. Looks too bright at the moment, doesn't it? But by the time I get everything in there, and I can always go duller. Duller is a piece of cake. You can't go brighter, but you can go duller. So uh, let's, uh, let's just carry on here. So we're going to go. If I'm carrying on, I have to remember to dampen this spot but not the halter because the halter is actually a different color. The halter is darker. It's true. I don't really need to work around it, but there's um, a bit of metal. There's a bit of metal and this is definitely blue in there. So I don't want to get any um, 
I, I just want to work around it and and that way I won't have any issues. Like here, for example, this halter is very blue compared to the horse, which is very brown. So I can't just paint the brown through it and put the blue on top. That won't work. So I am working around it. Plus it reminds me where it is. I don't have to worry about losing pencil lines and things like that. Um, I'm just going to wet with this large brush. Wet well beyond where I'm going to work. That was so wet that it just went where I want to have blue. So if I take some blue, cobalt blue. Now the blue is the highlight, so don't get it too dark. Uh, I think that can really um, <laughs> have a huge impact on your painting if you go too dark with your highlights. The paint needs to be pretty diluted. I won't spend a, I won't invest a lot of time in in this hindquarters and the belly because it's the face, right? The face is what this particular reference is about. So I'm I, it's there for context, but we don't need to put all the detail in. So don't get bogged down by these areas here. It's almost better if those go out of focus. That's the way your eyes work. If you're looking at a horse at their face, you know, you're looking into their eyes. You can't see their hindquarters in, in focus. Their hindquarters are in your peripheral vision, so you can't see that. So there's no sense in investing a lot of time making it perfect and crisp and everything. You just need the suggestion of it. Uh, but I would try and get you know, similar values to what you're, what you're needing. They're overlapping a little bit. I could just darken this a little bit more. Go with my my deeper mixture with the Payne's Gray. I could darken this one too, but I'll come back to that. Once I get a ghost version of everything, I can I could just build on that and build and build and build. Uh, but this light version of of my painting is really going to help me. So I think it's I think it's pretty important. Once again, I'm wetting, wetting an area way beyond where I'm going to actually stop, but I'm wetting this area so that I can paint into it. Probably get over to about here. Realism does take time. I'll use some more burnt sienna. I can red it up a little bit. If I add a little rose door, that will make this a little bit more chestnut. So you can see some of those chestnut colors in there. like those 
those color I don't think that's wet enough so I'm not going to touch that missed a spot there obviously burnt sienna and a little rose door whatever reddish orange red you have should be looking actually at the screen I'm looking at my reference which I know the colors are kind of off so I should be looking on my screen My blue can even get a little bit darker in here. Remember the colors are a little bit more lively just where, where they transition. The colors get a little bit more lively. A little bit less uh, mixed up with other colors. I better get things wet here. Didn't wet that far, so I've got to get this wet. The problem that um, I've always run into is you wet a whole large area, and you can't get the whole thing done before you before the paper starts to dry. So. If I'm just sort of wetting in advance of where I'm actually going to be painting, I find that helpful. The only trouble with uh, that you're likely to run into here is that you will put down too much water and it will make a it'll create a bloom. It'll push back at the paint you just put down. There's where the problem lies. This works really well, but it, I can make it really wet up in here. There's no fresh paint up in here. But as I come down here, I better blot my brush and help that blend a little bit because I, I don't want to create a blossom. Now, that's not very even, so I'm just going to keep coming in and uh, softening that. Burnt sienna, a little bit of little bit of Rose Door. Rose Door is, um, is not available in every brand, so it is, uh, it's a lot like um, Scarlet Lake in other brands. Okay, those highlights are kind of blue, aren't they? So better get my blue out. Don't want to put blue over top of my burnt sienna. I want the, they can sit side by side beautifully, but as soon as I put um, put them on top of each other, they will neutralize each other because they're complements. Gonna go these over these darks. Oh, that was definitely a dry spot. Mistakes will happen. Sometimes if you react instantly you can solve them. It's very often what I do now is, is, you know, if I can react quickly, I can resolve the problem before it's a problem. So I need to come in with more chestnut color here. 
some of the there's a few hairs that come down there I think they'll be uh, I'll be able to cover that no problem but if there's any concern about covering something just take a smaller synthetic brush and remove where you think those hairs are going to come down right so they'll come down here and take out some of that chestnut color if the hairs are going to have uh, some blue or some contrasting color on there. Let's paint the inside of this. Now this isn't, I'm not going to wet this first. This is way too small. But I will paint the inside of this uh, loop in the halter. Most of what's down here is more chestnut color. And again, we've got a little window in the middle of this halter. Coming up to the ear. Now I'm mostly working on dry here because you know I can sort of I can stop there, right? I don't have to be too concerned about that, but um, just to keep things moving here, I'm gonna keep moving as well. There's some blue highlights on this uh, mane, so I don't want to get that all uh, painted in brown if I know that I have to put some blue highlights on there. Didn't get that wet first, so I'm going to dampen it now. Working around the eye, I don't want to, don't want to obliterate my nice detail that I just put in the eye. But there are bits of blue on the face. There's um, some highlight here. There's some highlight on this part of the nose, the front of the face. Even on this muscle here, there's a little highlight because it sticks out. Nope, I'm getting down below the halter. I didn't wet there. So back to my chestnut color. And I will work around those blues that I just put on. I think some of them could probably be a little stronger than I did, but that's okay. I can build, I can always add. Can't take away too easily, but I can add very easily. It does take patience, that's for sure. Making sure this gets soft. It's some of it's uh, not blending as as much because it wasn't as wet as I thought it was. So you just got to react quickly. As long as it's really wet, you can still uh, make your correction. If it's been drying, leave it alone. Like if it's if it's been a minute or two, 
uh, that's probably too late. You'll end up making a patch. So timing is everything. But I love the colors that are happening in here. They're, they're exaggerated right now, of course. Uh, but that's going to be such a... Um, that translates to the viewer as highlight and shadow. It translates to the viewer as form. So these things are quite important. Uh, correct. Jackie's asking, uh, the, the synthetic brushes don't hold as much paint or water as the squirrel hair brushes. Natural hair brushes, um, the, the hairs themselves are, are absorbent. So the whole thing and, and the bristles don't line up quite so straight. They're getting better and better every day at producing synthetic brushes that behave like, uh, like natural hair brushes, which is a good thing, right? We don't want to, we don't want to be always using uh, natural hair brushes, but, uh, but in some cases, I just I can't find a substitute that's quite as uh, absorbent, like quite as thirst, uh, or will hold as much as a synthetic brush or a natural hair brush. Natural hair brushes hold lots. Oh, bay colored. <laughs> okay. When I say chestnut, I don't mean it's a chest. Like I know that there's all these terms that um, ho these horse people use. So when I say chestnut, I'm, I'm just sort of referring to a general color. I am not referring to a chestnut horse. Um, so sorry if that's confusing. <laughs> yes, this is just sort of the blocking in if you will of all of this but the thing is you can't block it in like a patchwork quilt it has to be all thoughtfully done with um, soft transitions between all the colors so that's why we have to do all of this wet so this is let me zoom out now so you can see a little more of what what the overall look is yeah so this is like the underpainting uh, for this if I wanted to do this horse in crazy colors, I could. I just would need to be consistent in uh, what I'm using in my highlight, what I'm using in my shadow, uh, that type of thing. If I'm consistent there, if I, I make sure that all the values are correct, uh, it, I could use crazy colors everywhere, which I've seen people do. Okay, so burnt sienna. little bit of that rose door. I'm going to come in and darken this jaw here. So my colors do look sort of bright and um, obviously brighter than the reference kind of thing, but they're bright in uh, their color saturation as well. I mean, they're just, they're lighter, but they're also brighter. That's okay. It's easy to tone down stuff like this. Rinsing my brush, just going really light blue here. I've switched over to my blue for around this mouth area and the nose. I can go right over what I did. That's what I like about doing this uh, grisaille type of uh, start to this is that I don't have to worry about, oh, where'd those pencil lines go? I can already see. I can already visualize how this is coming together. To 
wet. Okay, so that's probably feeling a little better. Now, obviously this is not looking right at all yet. So we have to get a little bit stronger in that section. But I want to make sure that's dry. So I'm going to I'm going to take a little bit uh, time to dry this. I've still got a little section under the between the halter and the jaw to do. That part type is just still plain paper. One of the difficulties of creating the muscle structures of a horse is that because all these shadows are softened, it doesn't, you're not doing yourself any favors if you are putting hard lines uh, where these soft structures are going to be, because that's always going to show up in your painting. So you have to make it look, um, like you just have to look for the placement. So for example, uh, the bottom of this shape here, right? This shape on the, on the neck, it lines up with the halter here where that connection of the halter is. So that's how I knew where to put that. I think I put it a little bit low, but, but you know, things like that, that's what you're going to be looking for is relationships of, to, of other things that you've already got. Okay, got a bit of a hard line here, can soften that. There's lots of room for correction at this point because uh, nothing's so dark or, or locked in that I can't uh, make an adjustment. Yes, I can use artistic license. That's very true. Okay, so I'm coming in here under the halter. That little space there. Now I'm making it blue, but it's also going to have some brown in it. So because there's overlap between this blue and this brown. Now I'm painting it realistically. I mean, if if you weren't painting it realistically, you wouldn't you might not worry about softening everything. You you could paint more more on dry paper cuz painting on dry paper is a lot simpler. You don't have to worry about the timing and, you know, what how far it's going to spread and how much how wet your brush is so much. Uh I mean, you do need to worry about that, but not so much when when you're working on um, dry paper. It's a little of that burnt sienna mix in there on top of the blue so it's not so bright. Some of that actually comes down into this body, but I'm keeping the these areas thin paint, diluted color, because it's very important not to block the light. Always don't just think of color, think of value as well. So the value there is very light. So we need to have a lot of the white of the paper coming through there. In fact, that's pretty, that might even be darker than I need it. So pull some of that off. That that looks dark right now. It's not. It will be. Um, it will look light by comparison to when I put the dar darker part of the halter on. Uh, are my paints non-staining? Uh, yes, I have not used to us any staining colors. Correct. I have not. If I were using something like a phthalo blue uh, or uh, like this, this little, I've got a little spot of um, quinacridone red. There's a difference between qu quinacridone red and qu quinacridone rose, uh, like permanent rose. And, and that is the quinacridone red I find is a 
it's a staining color. <laughs> it will it will stain your paper. So I'm not using any of that. I'm using this rose door. Scarlet Lake is also. So I'm also not using any opaque colors at this point. I am using, well, I don't use much opaque colors either in, in any case, but uh, the um, opaque colors will cover up. They won't, uh, they'll block the light. So I don't want to be using anything like that if I'm trying to create a highlight. Anything that has the word quinacridone is a transparent color. Um, transparent color doesn't mean that it's not staining though. Uh, transparent color means that the light can pass through it. Staining is just going to not come off your paper. So All right, so I want to wet this. I'm going to I'm just going to do a little more on this neck and then uh, we're going to wrap this up because I have another class. But I'm going to dampen this here because this part's really looking odd. And this looks like one I'll continue next week, I guess, because there isn't any way I can get this done in the time. But there we go. I've dampened it. I'm looking for, look at that nice smooth sheen on the paper. That's, I don't want any puddles or, or dry patches or anything like that. I'm going to let some of that soak in and I'm going to come in with my burnt sienna mixture here. Blot my brush. I don't want my brush drier than the paper so that um, it stays where I'm putting it. going to darken up some of this as well. So I'm going to add a little Payne's Gray. Well, Payne's Gray is pretty staining. I will say that. Payne's Gray has some staining qualities to it. It's not a terrible stainer, but it, it yeah, it will stain. I just remembered that I was using that as well. So All right, so I, if my brush is a little drier, I can make actual shapes in this and go around those blues. Really almost get specific about some of these places. And so you see how I've left that little sheen there? Yeah, it does look like a Palomino. Um, okay, so let's come in here. This is going to need to be dark by comparison. But all of those colors, all that stuff I did at the beginning is all showing through and and I know where I have to work. You know, it just makes it so much easier. And you can get as, you know, it all depends on your painting personality. Is You can get as specific as you want, or you can do this quite loosely and, you know, maybe you just want to darken what you've got here and that's, that's fine. It will still look good at this point. Uh, you don't have to go crazy detail the way I like to go. Uh, I know that may, that's not everybody's style. Not everybody's patient enough to, to uh, fuss the way that I would. 
I'm going to darken where the blues are now. All these spaces in between. And so as this gets darker, a little duller, not that much duller, I'm still just using blue paint, uh, but as that gets sort of melting together a little bit, it starts to make a little bit more sense. Okay, so it is, um, we're an hour and a half in. I've got most of that um, foundation done. Uh, probably would darken up in here a little bit more with uh, a little bit of that burnt sienna Payne's gray mix. I could, I could blend that in here. Now that was on dry, but if I rinse and blot, I can soften that without difficulty and get that darker. So that starts to make a little bit more sense. Uh, I deliberately made that nice and soft up here because I haven't finished what I need to do with the main and I don't want to leave a hard edge um, where that is. So uh, we'll continue this one next week. Let's uh, let's make sure I haven't missed any questions in the meantime, though. Uh, thank you very much, Pam. No subtitles in Spanish. Um, you will see those afterwards, I believe. I believe you can um, choose the uh, under the under the video. There's like a little uh, closed captioning there's a button you can touch and it will t ask you what language. What brush do I prefer? Um, I, I love my squirrel hair brushes. Um, now the brand is, is less relevant to me. Uh, it's, it's the nature of the hairs that it seems to, uh, I seem to like. So, uh, that, that part I do like is the, just the way the hairs behave, not necessarily, oh, I like this brand. This is the only brand you need to have. I'm, I'm not a branded ba ambassador for any company. So, um, you know, I, I'm not going to advocate or, or say anything bad about any other company because it's, you know, not my place. But uh, I do like the squirrel hair, the way it behaves. So I'm just touching a little extra dark in that corner <laughs> that really stood out. So I'll, I'll wait until next week before I continue that. All right, so I think I think I might have got all the questions. Uh, my paint's non-staining. Yes, I answered that. Uh, yes, it does not look like the photo yet. It will uh, if I keep going. Uh, you know, you might say, well, that doesn't look right. It's not, it's not red enough or it's not dark enough and everything else. And yeah, you're right. It's not. So we have more, more work to do. So we'll see you this time next week. Bye for now.